It's astonishing what one can conclude when grid-tied electricity is viewed as a natural right. As pointed out by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists on February 18th, 2016, climate change is accelerating, not slowing, with the construction and use of nuclear power facilities. Mm. James Hansen, take note. <laughs> we'll talk about him more later. And many other people who believe that nuclear is the solution to abrupt climate change. As I've pointed out for at least five years now, nuclear facilities, because of the concrete in them, and concrete produces a lot of CO2 yeah. in its construction. Nuclear facilities don't become carbon negative f until they've exceeded their safety date. And now, apparently, according to this evidence from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, they never get there. Well, so, nuclear seems to me to be the ultimate negotiation. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, but if we just do this. Yeah, if we just use this giant thing of poison. Right. <laughs> to power us. <laughs> never mind. As Michael Rupert used to point out, we have never built a human structure that has persisted, what, 50,000 years, I think he would right, say. Right. And, and we only need these things to be around for a few million. Right. And then we'll be safe. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, sure. Increasing drought threatens almost all forests in the United States, according to a paper in the February 21st, 2016 online issue of Global Change Biology. According to the paper's abstract, quote, diebacks, changes in composition and structure, and shifting range limits are widely observed, end quote. I've added this tidbit to feedback number 22. This is a little surprising because everybody thought the eastern deciduous forest was going to be wet forever. Mm. Soil moisture would, would always be in good shape. There's just a western forest that are threatened. But they did this very large-scale analysis with, I think, 14 authors from all over the country and found out that all forests, are essentially, <laughs> in the United States are screwed. Yeah. Absolutely, because of drought. Yeah. Who'd have thunk it? Wow. Well, I'm sure things will turn around soon. <laughs> just got to well, hope. In fact, the paper said this might be just a cycle. Oh, just yeah. in that, you know, it reminds me of climate change deniers who say that the, the solar cycles are responsible for ongoing climate change. Yeah. It's just a cycle. We'll pull out of this. We'll be fine. We'll Everything's yeah. going to be right. Of course. Well, I mean, for people who look like us. Right. And if anything bad happens, it won't happen until the end of the century. <laughs> but if we get started right now, we can change it. Here we go. <laughs> sea level rise is proceeding at the fastest rate in the last 28 centuries. Yeah, that's a lot of... That's, that's a, a lot, lot of time. <laughs> that's, a, that's not forever, right. which is a long time, especially toward the end. Yeah. But 28 centuries, that's yeah. still a long time. That's older than you. Yeah, that's older than Jesus. Who? <laughs> that's right. And he's been dead for about two centuries. Yeah. No, 20. 20. Yeah. 20. Oh, my goodness. This is eight centuries before. This that. is a long time ago. Right. So sea level rise is proceeding at the fastest rate in the last 28 centuries, according to a paper in the February 22nd, 2016 online edition of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it looks like we have Paul calling in from British Columbia. Paul, mm -hmm. what you got going? Hey. Oh, I guess I got the wrong phone number. I thought this was the uh, Tucson to Mud Hut shuttle service line. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I mean, it's a small business. Um, <laughs> we'll have somebody pick you up right there, Paul. Oh, good. Well, I'll be expecting that when when I get there. Um, just phone to say hi, and uh, and I was wanting to get your opinions, both of you, on it seems like as the faster than expected thing continues, this Arctic ice is probably going to go away this year. But I just wanted to get uh, both of your thoughts on that and i'll okay. leave the, and i'll leave the call I'll, I'll hang up now and you guys can have a chat and we'll see you soon thanks right. paul we appreciate it okay bye some of you might remember paul marcotte who has uh, uh, been with us on the show a time or two yeah he's always making his next to the last visit here to the mud hut <laughs> you know, he'll, be, he'll be doing that in about a week or so right if we get there. Right, exactly. I mean, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Especially like, with the sea ice. There's the trip between here and Tucson, for That's example. Right. right. With me driving. Anything can happen. That's true. <laughs> so I'm scheduled to pick Paul up at the airport right. in about 10 days, and we'll, we'll record next week's show from Tucson. Mm. And I'm going to go there a few days early and chat, visit with some people, and do the show from there. Right. 
So, what do you think about Arctic sea ice? Is uh, it a good idea? <laughs> I'd vote for it. <laughs> it's, a, it's an election year. Um, let me ask a really dumb question that somebody, I don't know, um, voting might ask. Why would we need Arctic sea ice? Oh, that's a fun question. Uh, humans have, have never been on a planet without ice in the Arctic Ocean. Mm. Wow. And it's not just albedo. It's not just that white ice reflecting incoming sunlight back into space. Right. And, and instead we have this dark um, blue ocean that is soaking up the heat. That's not, that's not it at all. Okay. There's the latent heat of the ice. Once the ice is gone, the energy that is coming from the sun is going to heat up the water much, much faster than it currently is. And let me use an example I sometimes use in my presentations. Say you're walking around in, at a party and you've got a glass of whatever your favorite beverage is mm -hmm. with ice. Okay. So not beer. Right. But some other beverage with ice. And say it's half ice and, and, and half whatever you're drinking at the time. So the whole time there's a little tiny bit of ice there, the temperature of that liquid is zero degrees Celsius. Okay. It's freezing. Right. Even with a little tiny sliver of ice, it's still freezing. But once the ice is gone, it starts heating up very rapidly, and it'll reach room temperature in a matter of minutes. Right. Okay, so you're walking around, and I did this once at a presentation. I took a, a glass of ice water. No, really, it was. <laughs> and for the hour-long presentation and for the half hour afterwards for the mm -hmm. Q&A, it was zero degrees. It had a little bit of ice. Right. But then the ice melts. There's no more buffer from that little bit of ice. So all of the energy that was going into melting ice is now heating up the water. It's a huge difference. For example, the transition from solid water, ice, to liquid water, what we call water, right. um, that um, transition... Once it occurs, um, it, it takes eight, approximately 80 calories of energy to melt a gram of ice and turn it into a gram of water or, okay. a, yeah. or a milliliter right. of water. 80 calories, incoming calories. Right. Okay, So that's quite a bit of energy. Well, once you've melted the ice, all of those 80 calories are going into heating the gram of water. So if it's just a gram, if you have one gram of ice and it takes a while to melt... And then it becomes water, and it takes 80, gram, 80 calories to convert that one gram of ice to one gram or one milliliter of water. Now that same 80 calories heats it to 80 degrees Celsius. Okay. That's scalding hot. Yeah. So a little bit of ice really goes a long way. Right. So when the ice is gone from the Arctic Ocean, the heating of the ocean there will occur at an exponential pace. And it looks like we're on pace for that to happen this year, although it looked like it was on pace to happen last year as well. Right. But based on the data so far, we passed the maximum ice extent in the Arctic about a week ago. For the season. For the year. For the year. Yeah, yeah. for the season, for the year. Generally, that doesn't happen for another month or so. Okay. And so it looks like we're already losing total ice extent right. in the Arctic. And the ice extent now is more than two standard deviations from the mean for this time of the year, which means if you don't do stats, that's a lot. Yeah. So it's a huge difference. And people warn all the time about when something is two standard deviations from the mean, that's, that's pretty serious business. Right. And this is very serious business. So last year at this time and after this time, we were, we were approximately two standard deviations below the mean as, as well. Okay. And we didn't lose all the ice. In fact, it was only, I believe it was the fourth lowest ice extent on record. Gotcha. And records have been kept since 1979. It's still down, way down from 1979. Um, but if we lose the ice this year, it, it, it would very much surprise me if we didn't have that 50 gigaton burst of methane come out of the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm that Natalia Shakova says is, quote, highly, possible, highly likely at any time. Yeah. So that's a big deal. That, that alone would warm the planet, global average, 1.3 degrees Celsius. Yeah. 
and and we're already that's not room temperature folks <laughs> <laughs> we're already over one yeah and in fact let's play a little a little audio from a presentation delivered recently by Kevin Trenberth at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And he's given this presentation and he's talking about the global average temperature so far. And this is a very recent presentation because he's talking about events that have just happened that we just have the confirmation of within the last couple of weeks. So give a listen for just a few seconds. So when you're talking about a jump of two-tenths of a degree, um, two-tenths is, is, uh, you know, 20% of the total rise over the entire past century, and that's all happened in this past year. Yeah, yeah, repeat that, would you? (laughs) Oh, that's incredible. So two-tenths of a degree Celsius temperature rise occurred in 2015. Right. That's 20% of the total global average temperature rise in the last hundred years. Wow. And it happened in a year. Yeah. So when we talk about the exponential function, this is the sort of thing we're looking at. Yeah. It's exponential growth. So so the temperature since baseline, roughly seventeen fifty, has increased about a about one degree or one point one point two degrees mm-hmm. up until twenty fifteen. And then in twenty fifteen it increased another point two degrees. Well I guess we better start recycling. <laughs> I don't think you understand the nature of the predicament. How about Hello Car? I appreciate your bargaining. Okay. Really, I do. Uh, nuclear? Um, <laughs> uh, eat organic. Let's just negotiate some more. Uh, it's working for everybody else. Free range chickens? Yes. Yes. Free range, organic, GMO free, no hidden relationships. relationships. It's all going to be fine. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Again, we're taking your calls, or you're going <laughs> to have to put up this banter for the rest of the show. All right. You want to continue with the uh, climate? Yeah. The number again is 888-874-4888. Last little tidbit on the climate update. I've recently completed a brief analysis of some of the self-reinforcing feedback loops. I just added the effects of the loss of global dimming with the only two self-reinforcing feedback loops for which we have an estimate of temperature rise. And I'm going to post this on the blog, guymcpherson.com, tomorrow. Okay. At least that's my intent. The bottom line is that we're scheduled for at least a 7 degree Celsius temperature rise that's above where we are right now within a decade or two. That takes us be, beyond 8 degrees Celsius above baseline, commonly accepted at 1750. The rate would exceed any known global average rise in temperature and brings us to a temperature beyond that experienced by any version of human. It takes us to a global average temperature characteristic of the days of the dinosaurs. Oh. Or 60 million years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Dinosaur days. Considering our reliance on habitat, this seems a little inconvenient to me. I mean, it's, 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 we're already experiencing global, global average temperature rise faster than has ever been reported in the history of the planet. And this would take us to one of the two long-term stable states that Earth has experienced in the last two billion years. Two billion years. Billions. And there's really only been two stable states. There's Ice Age and there's what I call Jurassic Park or Dinosaur Days. Right. And those are the long-term stable states. And there have been relatively rapid transitions between those two states in the past with the most rapid of them when the temperature is rising from Ice Age to Jurassic Park. And so it appears that we're in one of those, and, and currently the temperature rise is proceeding at somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times faster <laughs> than, the, than the great dying. Yeah. The, the big is extinction the, event. The super great dying. <laughs> right? The super great. Super duper super awesome Super Nova great. fast great dying. <laughs> <laughs> Must go faster. <laughs> the definition of civilization. Yeah. So this is this is a really really big deal. I never connected these together. I've never added together the effects or the forecast effects of the feedbacks before. Right. And I'm only doing that for the two feedbacks that we have estimates <laughs> of: methane, right, atmospheric methane, and uh, moistening of the upper troposphere. Okay. So I'm adding those two along with global dimming. 
which comes from collapse of right. industrial civilization. And and even if you don't think collapse is hovering nearby, then a global average temperature rise associated with either release of methane into the atmosphere or moistening of the upper troposphere will take us there in the short term regardless. Right. Because we just can't grow grains at scale in the interior of large continents when we exceed a couple of degrees global average temperature rise. Right. It's too warm. Well, and, you know, we could we could get the collapse some other ways as well. You know, we, it could be a pandemic. Oh, yeah. Uh, which obviously is related to climate change because of the expansion of, let's say, a carrier like a mosquito. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at coffee this morning, um, our friend Steve mm-hmm. brought in a tick oh. that he pulled off his body at Morro Bay, California. And when he was in Oregon a few years ago, he did the same thing. And he took it in, and he told the people in Oregon, I can't remember the town, that he had this uh, deer tick and that he's worried about Lyme. Yeah. And they said, no, we don't have Lyme here. There's no need to worry about that. Right. And it was Lyme. Yeah. And this is climate change. Right. And this is a, this is a while back. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And so he just got his second bullseye which is the, the pattern you get when you're, when you're bit by a deer tick right. that's carrying Lyme disease. Right. And so he brought the tick in just for all of us to see and, and, and <laughs> Did pass he it around. like a deer head? Well, that was the suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you taxidermy the old uh, tick. <laughs> so, so, no, he hasn't mounted it yet. He just had it in a Ziploc bag. Right. And Jay, Jay was a little worried it was going to get away. Oh, you know, and bite everybody in right. the room, or, or no? He wasn't so much worried about that. He was worried about it biting Jay. Right, <laughs> go on a terror. <laughs> right. All right, you're listening to Nature Bats Last and the Progressive Radio Network. Today we're taking calls eight 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 seven four forty eight eighty eight. It's your chance to bring up something. We have Dries from 